Atheist Nomads episode 407, Don't Drink Cow Urine. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-haws. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and it's just going to be me today. And this is one of those weeks where, like, looking at the headlines, it's like... Okay, yeah, there's a couple stories that are... Actually, no. There's two that are COVID related. The rest of these all seem like they could have happened before Trump. And I love that. I like not having to pick, sort through news stories and pull out the ones that are just too brutally terrible and have the bar set so high for what's worthy of talking about that the normal stuff to talk about all vanishes. It's really nice to be getting into something that feels a little bit more normal. Now, this is despite the fact that, you know, as of recording today, uh, Liz Cheney was stripped from her House leadership position because she still says that the election wasn't stolen from Trump and that the Republican Party shouldn't be following Trump. But the conservatives don't want to have, they don't care about facts and will punish people for following facts. So, you know, having one of the two major parties in the United States still denying reality and punishing people for accepting facts, that that sucks, but that is what we've come to expect over far too many years. Um, and, and it is really disappointing to see the Republican Party go to that point of still even four months after he left office, still agreeing that they are the party of Trump. But that's not one of the news stories that I really wanted to talk about. That's just one. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a bonus one. So first up, we have Graysville Elementary School in Ringgold, Georgia, where a teacher gave a student a backpack that had been donated to the school. And when the kid got the backpack home, what the parents found in it was a Bible and a note from the church that had donated the backpack to the school. And what the parents found in the backpack was a purple King James version of the Bible with a note in it asking the kid to, quote, visit them and become part of the Katuska Baptist Association family. Of course, the parents complained to the school and contacted FFRF, and FFRF contacted the school, and both were talked to by the media. Not the parent, but FFRF and um, the school. And FFRF is saying, obviously, this was a clear violation of church-state separation. The school is going with the position of they get backpacks donated to them all the time to give out to students. It mostly comes from churches and they've never heard of a problem before. They don't check the backpacks. At least they haven't been checking the backpacks. Uh, FFRF pointed out, quote, you can imagine the outrage if there were Qurans being given away to every student with an invitation to go to a Muslim church. You can see how the community would probably would feel differently than it may about the Bibles. That was uh, Chris Line, a staff attorney with FFRF. And yeah, the school was very clear they were not intentionally doing this. They didn't know. They were hoping they, they just didn't know. And three or four different churches donate backpacks and they hand them out. Um, this particular church usually donates around 100 backpacks a year to various schools around the county, and these backpacks are filled with school supplies and Bibles, which means over the years, thousands of Bibles have been given out to students through the school. The big point that FFRF has made with this case is at the point that a school employee, whether it be one of the counselors or a teacher, and this program is usually managed by the counselors, uh, but in this case it was the teacher who gave the student the backpack, that creates a endorsement of religion. Because at that point, it is the teacher or the counselor that is handing 
the Bible to the student, even if they don't know. And that is a huge problem. <laughs> I'm sure in a rural county in northern Georgia that 85 or 90 percent of the parents are happy to see their kids coming home with a Bible, but the ones that don't, I'm glad one finally said something. Uh, to fix this in the future, the counselors that are actually doing the receiving of the backpacks will be inspecting them to make sure there isn't anything in there that shouldn't be, that it is just school supplies. And it's always nice to see school districts take quick action to rectify problems where churches were taking advantage of them and they didn't know. In 2015, FFRF tried to put one of their nativity scenes in the Texas state capitol. And Governor Greg Abbott from Texas decided that it needed to be removed. This was after it was already put up, that it had to be removed. So FFRF sued over unambiguous viewpoint discrimination, and it took until June of 2018 for the U.S. District Court judge to rule in their favor, FFRF's favor. Greg Abbott filed an appeal. Uh, he had the executive director of the Texas State Preservation Board join in on the, the lawsuit, arguing that the district court didn't have the authority to decide the case, that this was a internal issue for the state and not a matter of, you know, the First Amendment matter mattering to it. Obviously, the appeals court disagreed. <laughs> and in April of last year, the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals um, ruled in favor of FFRF. They ruled unanimously in favor of, of FFRF. They not only affirmed that the lower court had the right to decide the case, but they also instructed the lower course to, quote, issue a more expansive remedy to protect FFRF's right to display or to place displays in the future and ensure a similar constitutional violation cannot happen to other organizations, end quote. So the original judge, Lee Yackel, has now reissued the order to handle that. Um, he again ruled in favor of FFRF and have provided perspective relief in joining Abbott and the board from censoring FFRF speech in the future, meaning that if the state is going to allow people to put up holiday displays in the state capitol, that they have to allow all displays. That if atheists or Satanists or Hindus or Muslims or anybody wants to put up a display they can, and they can't censor group speech. Now, of course, if somebody were to try to put up something that is, would generally be viewed as obscene, that's a different story, but nobody's going to do that. And the only other option the state would have is to not make the rotunda of the state capitol a free speech zone and just keep it to business, which I think is probably what most people would like to see out of their state governments. All right, last Thursday was the National Day of Prayer, and the event they held in Mississippi, well, one of the events they held in Mississippi, had the governor, the state's secretary of state, and others uh, from the government speaking, and the secretary of state used his time representing the state government at the Mississippi Coliseum to say, quote, I believe we need Christian men and women in office today more than ever before. And if you're a believer, if you're a member of the church, you understand the signs of the times right now. In the last few years, no more than ever before in the history of the church, we see the end times. End quote. Governor Tate Reeves didn't do much better, but he didn't outright say Christians need to take over the government. Uh, he is a well-known Christian nationalist, but he didn't outright say they needed to... Uh, the end is here and we need to take over, like Watson did. But the press release for the event made it pretty clear that this kind of stuff was going to be happening. Um, it included in it, prayers will be offered by Governor Tate Reeves, Commissioner Andy Gibson, and other dignitaries, pastors, and local citizens for the seven spheres of influence in our culture. Government, church, family, business slash commerce, education, media slash arts and entertainment, and military. Americans from all walks of life will gather on May 6th to uplift our country in prayer on the National Day of Prayer. Our nation has endured a year marked by unprecedented challenges. We know prayer has carried us through these days and the hand of God will move us on to a brighter future, blah, blah, blah. 
The Seven Spheres are also known as the Seven Mountains Mandate. This is something that has been going on for decades where Christian nationalists have been trying to take over what they view as the critical areas of influencing the culture. And I would say, yeah, if you can take over and and they have the goal of taking over all of these areas and that once they get control of these seven areas that they will be able to drive the culture the direction they want. And yeah, if you take over the government, they already have the tr- well and, and expand their control of the church into not just fringe evangelical groups, but into more mainstream groups, which they've done. Uh, They've done a a lot of work to take over the government, take over business, education, the media, and the military. They've got a pretty good hold on the military. They've got a decent hold on business, well, some business. Education and media is what's left, and that's terrifying. I don't think they necessarily meant to, but in their press release, they basically outlined the Christian nationalist agenda, and that That's scary. Last year, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 in a workplace discrimination case that determined that federal laws against sex discrimination also apply to LGBT people. Whether you're, you know, gay or trans, it applies because that is discrimination based on sex. Trump was not happy with that decision. And part of his response to that was to get a rule pushed through to narrow protections against discrimination in healthcare that pushed the conscience angle. So if you've got religious reasons to deny service to anybody who is gay or trans, then you can do that. We talked about both of those stories when they happened. Um, and most large healthcare organizations ignored those change that change in rule in rules. And uh, Biden, the Biden administration has now updated that regulation, reaffirming that federal law forbidding sex discrimination in healthcare also protects gay and trans people. Now, again, this change in rules is very important. It's necessary. It also probably doesn't change anything, just like Trump's change in the rules didn't change anything. Organizations that had anti-discrimination policies before that rule changed, uh, most of them knew better than to try to change those rules. Any that did, will need to change them again. (laughs) Um, And it's always good to see... Um, these protections be affirmed in the law and in regulations. And after I take a quick break, we've got some international news. To understand what's going on right now in Jerusalem and with Israel and, and the Palestinians, we need to start with the partition of Palestine, or maybe even even earlier than that. The When the Zionist movement started, it was about 100 years ago, Yeah, a little more than 120, 130 years ago. And uh, Christians were trying to get rid of Jews in Europe and the U.S. And uh, were willing to pay their way to move to the Holy Land, to Palestine, which at the time was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. After World War I, Britain gained control and more and more Jews moved into British mandate Palestine. With World War II and Hitler and genocide, even more Jews moved to the British Palestine mandate. And when Israel became, Israel and the Palestinian state became independent in 1948, war immediately broke out. And by the end of that war, Israel had control of its territory and Egypt had control of Gaza and Jordan had control of the West Bank including East Jerusalem. At that point, a lot of Arabs in Israeli-controlled territory moved to the West Bank, and a lot of Jews in Arab-controlled territory moved to Israel. In 1967, with the Six Days War, Israel recaptured the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem and started a program of, or pogrom, perhaps, of uh, trying to settle, uh, try to settle Jews and Israelis in as much of the West Bank and especially East Jerusalem as they could. They also established a policy that Israelis are able to claim that if their family owned land, 
but it was taken from them during a war or conflict that they can sue to get that land back. Arabs do not have that right. Additionally, in an attempt to make Jerusalem a, as much as possible, a purely Israeli and Jewish city, Israel has been getting in the way of Palestinians in East Jerusalem from doing land development and rebuilding, uh, you know, upgrading their buildings to handle growing population while they approve almost any Jewish request to do any land development. The specific current issue is around Jewish settlers who are trying to acquire land in Palestinian neighborhoods just outside of the old city in East Jerusalem and have been suing under this law allowing them to retake land their family had once lived on. Now, this sp specific battle is over the homes of six families. That's not a lot, but when you consider 200,000 Jews have moved into Arab neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, uh, crowded Arab neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, it, it makes sense that there would be, they'd be upset. And also, it's developers trying to seize the land of six families, forcing them out of homes that they have probably been in, their families have probably been in for a long time. And the particular neighborhood just outside of the old city, uh, when I was, the, the archaeological dig I did in Jordan, I made a, uh, most of us on the dig did a, a weekend trip to uh, Jerusalem. It was an unofficial official trip because we officially couldn't go anywhere that had a UN or not a UN had a U.S. Uh, State Department travel advisory against it, and Israel absolutely had a travel advisory against it. So we were not officially going, uh, but we went. And the hotel we stayed at was in East Jerusalem, in the Arab part of you know, and an, a densely populated, very crowded, very cramped, very densely populated uh, neighborhood of Palestinians uh, living in, in East Jerusalem. And we were just like two or three blocks from, I think it was the Damascus Gate. At the start of Ramadan, the Israeli police there in Jerusalem set up barricades blocking off the Damascus Gate. Uh, the old city of Jerusalem has, has a very large uh, wall from the Middle Ages around it. There are gates, various gates around it, but to get in, you have to go through one of those gates. And it is a long walk to get to the next gate. A very long walk to get to the next gate. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, man, it was crazy how much walking we did. And so obviously that started up some, that, that increased the tension, just that move of block of the barricade, um, especially since that's a spot where Palestinian Muslims like to gather during Ramadan to pray when they are breaking fast each day. As it progressed, the Ramadan prayer gatherings at the al Aska Mosque and Dome of the Rock, as well as at the Damascus Gate, began to have a tendency of shifting into protests of the apartheid practices of Israel. The place on top of the Temple Mount where the al Aska Mosque and Dome of the Rock are uh, is a, a large open area, relatively large. Um, when I went there in 2007, as you climbed up, there were numerous signs from the Rabbinate of Jerusalem uh, reminding observant Jews not to step foot on God's mountain or else they will be cursed. Uh, there were numerous police checkpoints we got up there. We weren't allowed to enter either building because not Muslim. Only Muslims can go into the buildings. And there were a lot of Israeli police in body armor and with assault rifles uh, patrolling the area. And that was just on a pretty boring Sunday morning. There weren't a lot of people up there, but there were a lot of cops with assault rifles. That was something that I'd already gotten pretty familiar with in the. Arab quarter of, or the Muslim quarter of the old city, where on almost every street corner, there were cops with assault rifles. They were everywhere. You go to the Jewish quarter, and there was hardly any police. But in the Muslim quarter, there were tons of cops. And I know I could feel the tension when I was there. Uh, when we first got there, we uh, got pizza. And while we were in this little pizza restaurant, uh, we saw a group of Muslim worshipers heading either heading to or, or back home from Friday prayers. 
passing by a group of Israeli cops who were leaning up against their Land Rover and you could feel the tension. Uh, that was also two weeks after Hamas had seized the uh, Gaza Strip. Uh, so there's definitely some, there was definitely some height, heightened security postures and there were banners everywhere celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Six Days War of 1967. Well, right now in Jerusalem, Israelis are celebrating the anniversary of the Six Days War and their capture of East Jerusalem and questioning whether or not to allow the normal per victory parade to go or how to manage that parade so that it doesn't result in more mass protests or anger or and if you ask me just don't do it doing a victory parade of an occupied city through the neighborhoods of the people you're occupying is a dick move especially when you're still doing it 54 years later so Monday on the at the Al Aska Mosque, Muslims came out of the mosque and protested the started protesting. Uh police were there ready for them. Sounds like there was a lot of police there ready for them. The protest definitely took a turn for the worse when and I don't know that I've gotten exactly the order that it happened. Um, but the Israeli police fired stun grenades, smoke grenades, bean bags, and other non-lethal force and tear gas into the crowd and into the mosque. And protesters threw rocks at the cops. There are a lot of rocks up there. I, I, I remember noticing that there were a lot of rocks up there. It was almost surprising how many rocks are up there. <laughs> like nice paths and manicured lawns and rocks everywhere. <laughs> the end result of the protest was more than 278 Palestinians wounded. At least 205 had to be taken to the hospital and five had very serious injuries. I'm going to assume that means we're in critical care. Um, nine police officers were wounded. Only one required medical care. Uh, there was also a motorist who was pelted with stones and lost control of the vehicle, they had minor injuries. Uh, I, I do <laughs> remember that Saturday night in Jerusalem. We went to dinner in uh, downtown Jerusalem on the west side of the city, and when we were trying to get back to the hotel, we had to get a Palestinian driver because Jewish drivers were afraid to drive into East Jerusalem for fear of getting of their cars getting stoned. Yeah, maybe, that, <laughs> maybe that's what happened here. Um... And then, of course, since the weekend's protests, and I guess I was on the over the weekend, not Monday. Uh, since that happened, Hamas has been demanding Israeli police leave the Dome of the Rock in Al Aska Mosque, and have been backing up that threat by firing hundreds, if not thousands, of rockets into Israel. Uh, in response, Israel has been conducting airstrikes against Gaza. Uh, they have mostly just killed civilians on both sides with these attacks. And this all sucks. <laughs> this is one of those issues where there is no solution. The Dome of the Rock is the third most holy site in Islam. It's right next to the most holy site in Judaism and where the most conservative Jews want to rebuild the temple. To rebuild their temple, they would have to tear down the Dome of the Rock. Because the rock that is inside there is a meteorite that they believe is where the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the biblical temple and where the altar was in Herod's temple. And evangelical Christians believe that the temple have to be, has to be rebuilt before Jesus can return to earth. So they want the Dome of the Rock torn down so the, and the al Aska Mosque torn down so that Jews can rebuild the temple. And when you have three different groups with very different goals, all wanting the same exact spot of land, there's no way they can share it. Like right now, there's a sharing system in place where nobody builds anything new, nobody tears anything down. You get what's there. And well, the Romans did a really good job of 
destroying Jerusalem and kicking out all the uh, kick, kicking all the Jews out of Israel during the Ju uh, Jewish Roman Wars, and that left that available for Muslims to reuse the sites. And there's no real good answers to it. But forcing people out of their neighborhoods is not the answer. Moving your people into occupied territory is not the answer. And getting into fights at holy sites is not going to end well. The Israeli Supreme Court is holding off on the decision on uh, that that land dispute, and looks like Israel has decided they will allow the parade to go through, and this will probably continue to escalate, and the chance of it turning into a war are, it's greater than zero. Zarendra Singh is a MLA, member of Legislative Assembly, would be my guess, uh, who is a member of the BJB party in Uttar Pradesh in India. And India is in the middle of a really, really bad COVID surge where for weeks now they have been having troubles with getting medical supplies to handle patients and hospitals have been out not been able to take patients and crematoriums have not had the room to burn patients or burn corpses, and, like, it's it's bad. It is very bad. Uh, Mr. Singh has a plan on how to get around COVID-19, and it is to drink gamatura, just cow urine. He has been saying for years, apparently, that drinking cow urine will solve any health issue that you have, and he's very specific about how to do it. Uh, you need to consume it on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. You only need two or three capfuls mixed into a glass of water and then gulp it down. And then don't consume anything for half an hour. And this will cure any heart diseases and COVID and protect you and keep you healthy. Uh, he also suggests consuming roasted turmeric powder. Turmeric has gotten really popular in recent years in the west as this cure-all it's been kind of considered one in india for ever uh it's what makes makes yellow curries yellow so it's popular in food and it can make food taste good and it can give your curries kind of the right taste and, and flavor um it's not going to give you good health and drinking cow urine is so fucking ridiculous ridiculous and to claim that it can cure disease or prevent disease and that it can protect you against a pandemic is just downright dangerous especially when they're in the middle of such a bad bad wave of the pandemic in nova scotia the royal canadian mounted police have been trying to get people to take covid restrictions seriously and they'd already warned western christian Fellowship Church to stop having large in-person gatherings since those go against the restrictions in place and they have refused to stop. So when some Mounties saw a faith gathering about to begin, they warned the congregation, but the gathering went ahead anyway. So the police charged 26 people and the organization under the Health Protection Act for having a faith gathering contrary to public health restrictions. Each of the 13 men and 13 women present were fined $2,422 each, and the church was fined $11,622.50. Yes! <laughs> $11,622.50. $622.50. Like, are the fines in dollars and then they had to convert them? Or, or like, those just seem, like, bizarre to have not rounded off numbers like that. <laughs> it's weird. But those are serious fines. And hopefully they'll get other people to take this more seriously. And a couple weeks ago we talked about the Vatican ruling that Catholic priests cannot bless any kind of homosexual partnerships. In response to that, dozens of Catholic priests in Germany have gone ahead and defied that ruling and are live streaming the blessings online. The protest out of Germany is more than just that. There's also 230 professors of Catholic theology in Germany signing a statement protesting it. Uh, they declared the decree is 
uh, quote, is marked by a paternalistic air of superiority and discriminates against homosexual people and their life plans. And dozens of priests are now going to defy that ruling, saying, quote, in view of the refusal of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith to bless homosexual partnerships, we raise our voices and say, we will continue to accompany people who enter into abiding partnership in the future and bless the relationship. So, good for these priests. All right, we have more from Bob via the website. Or, quote, at 515 Mark, you completely ignored the first thrust of my comment. On your previous podcast, my comment was concerning your hostility towards Richard Dawkins, old white man, irrelevant, bigoted, dick, asshole, fuck you Dawkins, shut the fuck up. I briefly shared my experience simply to illustrate that it is possibly to be reasonably skeptical and critical of trans diagnosis. And you responded with a family counseling session. Gee, thanks. As a longtime listener of your podcast, I'm suddenly getting the impression, based entirely on your continued extreme hostility towards Dawkins, that you are quite dogmatic and rigid in your beliefs, rendering any criticism of your public stance a waste of time. You, sound, sir, sound very similar to a rabid Trump voter responding to something that Nancy Pelosi tweeted. No thanks. <clears throat> okay, Bob, I, yeah, I ignored the stuff that I thought didn't need to be talked about more and focused on what looked like a more important issue. So I guess, sorry, I hope I could try to help you out. So you're not happy with the hostility towards Dawkins. There's the whole thing with punching up and punching down. Punching down is where, was what he was doing with that tweet. Punching up is what I was doing with my response to his tweet. Punching down is an asshole move to do because it's somebody taking the power they have to pick a fight with or or push down somebody who has less power. Punching up is, well, you don't have the power to actually do any harm to somebody more powerful and more uh, more influential. Yeah, I took a hostile tone. I was pissed at the response, what, what he said and the responses of people backing him up. I'm a human being. I'm allowed to have emotions. I'm allowed to get mad. And when it's something worthwhile, it's worth having that on the podcast. As far as what Dawkins did in that tweet, he was comparing fraud with people who are trans. That is an incredibly hostile asshole thing to do. Uh, you are skeptical about trans diagnosis. That's not what the diagnosis is. It's Gender dysphoria. There is diagnostic criteria for that diagnosis. It's in the DSM-5. It has been thorough, thoroughly studied. And the studies have found that for people who have, who qualify for that diagnosis, that getting them on hormones and gender affirming surgeries reduces the chances of suicide, depression, drug abuse, tobacco use, and improves mood and overall well-being. If doing that for people helps that much, and I will go ahead and put the most recent study on that in the show notes, what's there to be skeptical about? These are people who are having a, were having really rough times who didn't feel like they fit in their bodies. And it's a diagnosis. It's in the DSM-5. <laughs> like, it's already there. It's often covered by insurance. It's like, it's a real thing. And I can be dogmatic and rigid in my beliefs when it comes to human rights, especially human rights of listeners and guests that have been on the podcast. And especially when I was doing the, you know, fuck you Dawkins, I was thinking about Callie and Alice and Avery and Celia and wanting to make a very clear stand that I stand with them, not a famous person who said something wrong. Also, if you don't want us to talk about your personal issues, don't post them on the internet, on our website. And if you think that sounds like a Trump voter responding to something Nancy Pelosi tweeted, well, that's fucking bullshit. And for another one that came in right before I hit record, uh, Sojo commented on uh, Patreon, quote, if you're thinking of restructuring the show to a consistent format each week, I'll say that while I know some shows thrive on having a prescribed format. That's not why I listen here. I appreciate the creativity and variety I c come by in your podcast. You've given me new perspectives. Keep it coming in whatever form works for you at the moment. As long as it works for you, I appreciate y'all's work." End quote. So, Joe, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I've been... 
It's always been a goal to have a consistent format. Uh, it's something we have had at various points for, you know, relatively long periods of time. Uh, I haven't been able to pull that off here in the last, what, 70 episodes or so. <laughs> um, so I'm glad you, you, you like the variability and yeah, we'll, we'll see what I come up with. Uh, I have ideas. Still working on those ideas, but going to keep going and getting episodes out. So thank you, and uh, it's always nice to be appreciated. That's it for this week. If you want to uh, contact us, you can use the contact form on the website at atheistnomads.com slash contact, or send us an email at feedback at atheistnomads.com. If you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com, or just go to Patreon at patreon.com slash atheistnomads. And until next week, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.